What's up everyone? In my last video, I showed you how I prepare a song for a mastering session. In particular, I walked you through a bunch of neat tricks and steps that you can take in Isotope RX Audio Editor to get the song dialed so that your mastering chain doesn't have to work quite as hard. In this session, I'm going to show you the entire mastering process, start to finish. I'm going to show you the full mastering chain, each effect that I used, why I used it, the settings that I used, what order I put it in, all the juicy good stuff. So let's go hit the control room and I'll show you the mastering chain. So here is the control room. Let's start off by doing a quick tour. We've got a custom mixing console desk that I built with my buddy Ezra, who used to be a professional cabinet maker. It is a wonderful desk to be able to work from. It has some rack mount space that I haven't filled up because I'm more of an ITB engineer. It's got slotted areas and kind of a snub-nosed design so that the desk is not in the reflection path of the monitors. We have a little slot where my MacBook Pro tucks underneath it so you just see the screen revealing more desktop space to work with. It's connected to an Apple Cinema display. If you've seen my previous videos, you'll know why I chose these. These are the Neumann KH420 flush mounted midfields and they are absolutely badass monitors. I'll drop a link to my video explaining how I chose these, what I like about them and the other speaker I compared them with if you want to check that out. And in general, I did an entire video series on the construction and the design process, all of the acoustics principles that went into creating this room, and I'll drop a link for that and a card for that in this video too, if you want to deep dive into the studio design. But uh, yeah, my main engineering headphones here are the Odyssey LCD5 open back. For doing YouTube videos and stuff, I have a Lewitt LCT440 pure condenser mic running through a Rodecaster Pro, which is fantastic. Uh, just bakes in these effects that I don't really need to change much in post. The entire room and ceiling has floor to ceiling, wall to wall, heavy acoustic treatment done with multiple layers of different types of porous absorption. On the rear wall, this is what is receiving the full frontal impact of the base from those Neumann KH420s. We have three and a half feet of insulation in the rear wall modules. We have graduated density and we have custom fabricated CNC Warp Academy backlit panels. Those are also functional slots or slats. They're kind of a slatted diffuser module, adding some scattering into the room. And we have horizontal slats that are also providing some scattering, a little bit of uh, live energy back into the room in a very controlled fashion. We've got some acoustic furniture that uh, I built that's been routered and slotted, so sound pretty much just passes through it. And then uh, over here, we've got a backup set of headphones. These are Odyssey uh, LCD Xs, and uh, I really like those ones, the low end in particular. We've got switches over here for ventilation and extra power. And speaking of ventilation, this room is airtight. It's hermetically sealed because sound will go wherever air goes. And so up there you have the air intake vent running from a Panasonic ERV that's mounted behind this speaker wall. And then you have the exhaust vent up there. And then the floors, because we don't want any forced air heating, the floors have three strips of in-floor heating. And they are all controlled from a little panel right here. So the room's warm and cozy when I want it to be. Right on. Well, that's a little room tour. I haven't done that before, so just wanted to walk you guys through the space that I work in here in the control room. Let's get into the master. Sweet, so I just wrapped up the mastering session and I'm ready to show you the results. So let's start by having a quick AB to the mix versus the master. The mix will be in blue and the master will be in green. Let's check it out. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Tree I say, what have you done to me? No point looking 
you for a rainbow I feel the pain go What have you done to me? Honestly, brother, it just sounds perfect. I don't know whether that just makes me a super easy uh, low maintenance client or just makes you a really, really epic mastering engineer. Um, I'm sure it's a mix of both, but um, honestly, yeah, I, I just really appreciate you for just kind of honoring and, and uh, preserving the mix that's there and just enhancing it in such a beautiful way. I can hear everything um, and it's just, yeah, it's perfect. I have no notes, no changes. Let's go with this master unless there's anything that you're hearing. I trust your ear and I'm just yeah, learning to just trust it more and more. All right, let's get into the mastering chain now. First up in the chain is a clipper. And this is a clipper called Gold Clip by Schwab Digital. I have a whole bunch of different clippers and I'm quite fascinated with them. And this one is the one that I have been using of late on my master. It's an excellent mastering clipper or bus clipper. I wouldn't use it on a track. It's, uh, it's meant for heavier weight duties. And uh, if you want to use a track version of it, that's a lightweight clipper, check out Orange Clip from Schwab Digital as well. But this clipper is special. It emulates a particular very expensive piece of hardware, uh, an ADC that is in a lot of studios and has particular sonic characteristics to it. And that's where you see some of these other parameters like gold. It's not just a clipper, it does other things. So what am I doing with it and why am I putting a clipper first in chain? Well, the concept of using a clipper is to shave off, uh, the way I'm using it anyways, is to shave off microtransients, these little blippy, tiny transients that are a few dB above the normal peak level in the song. And these are transients that might be a couple of samples to a couple of milliseconds long. Usually the crack of a snare hit or maybe the bite of a, of a bass pluck or the snare or the kick transient, something like that. And they're just these little things that pop up that can cause effects downstream of them that are sensitive to level like compressors, saturators, limiters, dynamic EQ to cause audible artifacts. So imagine if you have a snare transient that's like two samples and it's a couple dB louder, that's going to trigger the gain reduction circuit in a limiter and cause it to dip everything else full band. Or it might cause a saturator that's been very carefully set up to oversaturate and you get a crack of a snare that is particularly crunchy sounding and you don't want that. Well, putting a clipper first in chain cleans that stuff up and it is able to do so very transparently. The other school of thought with clippers is that you put it right before your limiter. That's also valid. It's a different approach. I used to do that, but now what I'm using the clipper for first in chain is to kind of feed the mastering effects that are downstream of it a more consistent signal. And consistency when it comes to setting effects down the road, like thresholds and things like that, really matters. So let's take a look in the display what I'm clipping, and you'll see that it's really not much. It's like the occasional little little micro transient coming by. I'm not I'm not really digging into the meat or the body of the signal. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Okay. Now the algorithm I'm using here is a soft clipper, which is not normal for me. A lot of times I hard clip, but I went for the classic soft clip mode in this particular instance because I felt like it suited the song. It's giving me just a little bit rounder uh, transients, a little warmer transients on the drums, and I like it. Now, the other feature that I'm using in this, which is not a feature of a standard clipper, it's this gold parameter. And what this is doing, it's activated by this knob here. And what it's doing is it's similar to upwards compression. It's inflating, blooming out low level material. So it's giving it a compressed sound. It's it's giving it less dynamic range. It's bringing up low level material, but it's doing so in a way very different from a compressor because a compressor has attack and release times and this does not. Okay, so let's A B with this on and off. Joshua Tree. What have you done to me? Joshua Tree. So you can start to hear it in things like drum tails, you can start to hear it in the bass. It just gives that information a little bit of bloom. And in general, I really like that. So there's the clipper. That's gold clip. Now, next up is a EQ. And in the mix, I noticed a few things when I listened to it. One is that the vocal is 
not as compressed uh, as vocals in a lot of songs in the genre. And, and I was hearing certain syllables just pop out to me in the vocal. Uh, I was hearing sometimes a little bit of chest tone come in, a little bit of proximity effect with the mic when you move back and forth. And I was hearing uh, definitely some some Fs and, and Ss, the sibilants, uh, pop out of the mix. And so if we take a look at Pro-Q3 and how I've set it up, I'm using it for some general EQ duties, but uh, I'm using it for a bit of cleanup as well. So you can see I have these three bells. They're all centered in the mid channel. Okay, so you can do that by clicking the EQ node and you can change the channel it's on here. They're all in the mid. They're all dynamic, no static nodes here. And I've fussed with the threshold to get these just right. And I'm talking small adjustments, 2 dB, 1.5 dB. And what that's doing is just, just controlling the vocal in a little bit that it's not getting... Uh, stepping on the rest of the track. You have to be so careful and gentle with masters. I'm not in control of the mix here, so I'm having to do this on the entire stereo master. Okay, and then uh, the other thing you're seeing is just a little bit of control on the kind of kick and bass region. And I'm just doing a little tiny subtractive dynamic cut. And then I'm giving it, uh, you know, once I dug into these two regions, 5K and uh, about 9K, uh, I, I wanted to compensate for that by just giving a little bit of a, a high shelf. Okay, so uh, let's bypass it and we'll listen to it with it off and on. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Tree I say, what have you done to me? Now, there's a particular part of the track where I really noticed this, and that was right about here, okay? Let's bypass, and I want you to listen to the vocal, okay? Baby, it's cold outside, but the weather gets warmer. Okay, do you notice the vocal's just a little jumpy there? It's just, just just pop popping out a little bit you can hear the you can hear the fundamental of the vocal around around 225 hertz or so just just jumping out a little bit so uh let's listen to that now with the eq baby it's cold see and you can see the dynamic nodes activating right and that's because i have very carefully set um thresholds and things like that some of them i'm using auto but in many cases i'm using a manual threshold on this and i've adjusted it okay so let's listen without Baby, it's cold. And with. Baby, it's cold outside, but the weather gets warmer. Nice. Okay, now I felt like it needed a little extra. The sibilance was still popping out to me, and so when I when I have that happening uh, in FabFilter Pro DS, there's a preset called Vocal DSing in Music, which is a great starting point uh, for this type of thing. And that's what I'm doing. I'm using it to try and just grab the vocal sibilance and pull them down. Okay, so this preset uh, is entirely oriented towards the mid channel. You can see it's using some look ahead. It's very tightly uh, band passed, uh, rather um, band selected into that sibilance range for the vocal. And uh, let's have a listen to that bypass and then on. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Tree I say, what have you done to me? Yeah, I don't love to do this type of stuff in masters. I, I'd rather not have to do that. I'd rather go back and do it in the mix. But um, when you're in the mastering phase, and you need to go to something like this, definitely this process works. You just have to be uh, very careful with it that you don't step on other things in the music. So I'm listening to other elements that are in that frequency range. And there's a plugin that helps me do that. And this is a plugin called Peel. And uh, it's, it's neat because it lets you draw a box and you can listen to just what's in that frequency range 
and exclude everything else and just what's in that area of the stereo field. And then you can invert it if you want to. Okay, so let's let's listen to this and, and use peel. Joshua. Joshua Tree Okay, so I was using Peel to be able to help me hone in on the areas that I was going to be working with using the filters here in Pro DS and using the nodes in Pro Q3. So uh, that just helped me to, to zero in. Nice. I'll leave that deactivated. Now, um, another thing I'm very judicious about, very careful about on a master is using saturation. You can really ruin a master with saturation because of intermodulation. And when you feed a saturator a complex signal, then it creates um, some indifference partials. Okay. Um, and there's a video I'm going to link you to below. It's not one of mine. It's from David Nazi at Mixbus TV. And he demonstrates for you the effect of using multiple tones into a saturator causing intermodulation. So I want you guys to watch that so you have the background and I don't see any point in reinventing the wheel. David's already covered that video of that topic very well. But uh, basically, if you're gonna put a saturator on a master, you better know what you're doing because it's very easy to ruin the master and cause really nasty sounding and low frequency, muddy intermodulation, uh, some indifference partials. So if I do use a saturator on, on the master, I better have a really good reason Okay. Now, why am I using this uh, on the master? What's my really good reason? One is because I just felt like the track in general could use some grit. You know, I have references that I'm comparing it to that the artist has provided. And I'm like, they're using some saturation, probably in the mix, probably on buses. Um, but if you're really careful and really surgical, and I'm able to be with this plugin, Black Box Analog Design. Uh, this is a physically modeled on a piece of hardware. This is the Brainworks edition. This is the mid-side edition, the HD2MS. And it is uh, an absolutely fantastic plugin. This is like one of, my, one of my tools that I use day in and day out. So how have I set this up? Well, let's, let's have a listen to it without it and, and with it, okay? Let's turn it off. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Tree. Okay. So first of all, I've set it up into mid-side mode, which is really key. If you're going to do it on a master, I would recommend mid-side mode. And then I've taken parameter link off so that when you make changes to the mid, it's not making them on the side. That makes no sense. And so here's the mid and here's the side channel. Okay, so let's go into what I've done. One is I have, uh, this plugin adds gain, okay? This is like a sports car. You're driving this thing. There's no drive-by wire. There's no automatic shifting. You have to manually gain adjust it down so that you're making an apples to apples comparison. So do not just turn this thing on. It's gonna make everything sound better because it's gonna fool your ears with loudness. You have to very carefully gain stage it down and compensate for it. And I do that by soloing the mid channel and then turning bypass on and off and then soloing the side channel and turning bypass on and off and manually by ear gain matching them, okay? So let's, uh, let's let me just demonstrate for you how, how I would do that, okay? Let's listen. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Okay, so I'd go through that process back and forth and and uh, gain match them and get as close as I can. I'm not fussy about it being absolutely perfect, but I want to get it so that I'm not hearing really big jumps in loudness. Okay, so now how have I set, set this up? I've engaged the saturation circuit in both. I've adjusted the amount of saturation in both. You can see I'm using much less saturation on the side signal. And then you have the ability to EQ what the saturator is see seeing and how it's processing harmonics. You can see I've excluded a bunch of low end using a 12 dB per octave high pass filter on the sides channel. Again, that just gets any bottom information out of the sides so that it's not causing extra saturation on the sides. It's not high passing the actual signal we're hearing. It's just high passing what the saturator is seeing. Okay. And then um, I've left the pentode and triode right where they are. 
And uh, then I've adjusted the output to gain match them. And then I've uh, done the same thing on the sides and I've gain matched the sides, even though they're receiving much less saturation. I've gain matched the sides so that it sounds, you know, so you're not changing the mid side balance. The last thing you want to do is start fussing with these controls. And then all of a sudden, when you turn the plugin on, you lose sides level, you lose side level, or you lose, or you increase side level. You don't want that. Okay. So, uh, so that's what I've done. So here's where we're at. Joshua Tree. And then the other thing I do is I'll solo so you can hear exactly what the saturator is adding. Joshua Tree. So I can hear how much crunch it's adding. And then you have the ability to use this density control. And what it's doing is it's effectively adding negative gain before the saturator and compensating it with positive gain the same amount after the saturator so that you get less saturation without fussing with all the settings. It's a really handy feature um, if you're finding that things are just a bit too crunchy. And so if I copy the A state and I pop it into the C state and I turn up density, okay, let's just listen to, to what that does. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Okay, let's engage solo in the C state. Joshua Tree And here's just just a mess, right? It's just a mess. And then you listen here. Joshua Tree Right? It's warm, it's fuzzy, but it's not a mess. Okay, so, so this can be really helpful in allowing you to dial in the density parameter. Okay, so uh, obviously we're not going to go with the C state, we're going to go with the A state. And then um, last two things I'll explain here is I'm using the air amount and the air on the sides channel. And what the air is doing is it's a high shelf filter and it's adding some uh, very high top end, about 10K and up, uh, to the sides of the signal to the side channel of the signal and uh, just giving it uh, some extra stereo width really the perception of stereo width without changing the mid side balance because you can do that with the width parameter down here stereo width i don't touch that ever i don't i don't like those you start turning up the width there you do so at the expense of the mid channel and you make your whole master sound hollow uh, i think that's a big mistake in mastering if you start to mess with stereo width on that simple of a level you have to be doing it uh, using uh, MSEQ or or uh, a multiband setup or something like that. Just a simple push up on the width. I would just never, never do that. I think it's a huge mistake. Okay. Final thing is I'm running it in parallel. So if you know if you max this out, doesn't really matter what you're doing. You're 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 going to hear it quite a bit. And I like this blend of the clean, dry signal with the affected signal of the plugin. Nice. So there's a little miniature masterclass on the black box analog design HG two MS. Isn't that a mouthful? Hey. Okay, another EQ. Okay, what am I doing with this EQ? This is the TDR Voss Slick M, the mastering EQ. Okay, and I am using two EQ uh, nodes in this. One of them is I'm using a, a, uh, a shelf. I'm using a high shelf here from 4K and up, and I'm giving it 1.5 dB. I'm just giving the whole top end a little bit brightness okay i'm using that and then uh i'm the second one i'm using is a also a high shelf but it's set at 26k so this is a really the center frequency is hypersonic however it is affecting the audible range slightly and what this is doing is it's allowed me to lift and bring a little bit of air into the top end of the track without grabbing and affecting things like hi-hats and crashes or the sibilance range of the vocal. Okay, so let's listen and I'll turn turn these on as we go. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Tree I say, what have you done to me? Yeah, I really like the the sound of this hypersonic high shelf, uh, giving it a lift 
in the very top and just yeah it does so in a way that it's not pulling and grabbing the uh harsh kind of elements that uh, could just be made too bright up next we've got a compressor this is a very nice mastering compressor called unisum by tone projects and I don't often actually use compression on my masters. I was talking a lot about this in my interview with uh, Nicholas DiLorenzo and in some other things that I've done recently. Oftentimes when I AB the master and I just turn the compressor off in the chain, I like the sound better. So uh, I would say use compression if you really think it makes it sound better, but don't compress your master or your mix just by default, okay? When you're using saturation for example it can take the place of compression when you're using clipping or what i'm doing in gold clip with the gold knob it can take the place of compression you know what is compression what what do saturators and what does the gold knob do they all increase low level material they reduce dynamic range they increase loudness and in the case of a a compressor and a saturator they will rein in and attenuate peak level gold clip doesn't do that the clipper does that, but the gold parameter doesn't. Okay, so um, you have to think about why you're doing that. And in this case, listening to uh, the mix without Unisum, I just was listening for gel. I was listening for, again, the presence of low-level material feeling into, does anything need to come up? You know, and maybe it's an EQ move, but it's not always compression, but maybe it's compression. Okay, so let's have a listen and then I'll I'll walk you through what I did in unison. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Tree I say what have you done to me? Yeah, right on. So what this is doing for me is it's bringing a sense of cohesion, of containment to the mix. And it's bringing up, in particular, the bass. I'm hearing that come up in the mix and some of the guitars and uh, just giving everything a sense of gel. I know that kind of sounds cliched. The glue compressor, the gel that it adds, you know, but but I really do. There's a reason why people say that stuff and it's because it can, and in this case does, add a sense of gel and cohesion to the to the piece. Let's go over the settings. Okay. This is a really deep uh, compressor. Oh my God. If you go down here, uh, you can make your head spin. If you want to go into that stuff, there's an amazing video that uh, Nicholas DiLorenzo did on everything in Unisum. I'll link that below. Uh, just be prepared for nerd level 10 because uh, he he goes full nerd <laughs> in, the, in that video. Um I'm using the easy setup here. And let's take a look. Attack time, 50 milliseconds. I don't want this taking out any of the transients, okay? The clipper has already helped with shaving off micro transients. I don't want to dig into the transients here, okay? So I've really backed off the attack. Release, 250. Medium fast. I left it at the default 2 to 1. This is mastering. We're not really getting heavy-handed with the compressor. I've adjusted the side chain. So this is excluding the kick, really, um, and the bass from the low base from the sidechain signal so it's not over triggering the compressor the last thing i want is for the kick to be pumping the compressor okay uh i've got uh i think that's default knee on it i haven't adjusted the knee the curve i've set to be a bit more linear uh it's a little louder and um yeah i like that release parameter i'm um, using full wet i've adjusted a bit of makeup gain and then i've taken it uh, 50% between stereo linked and stereo unlinked. Uh, I don't like fully linked devices a lot of times, um, especially with material like this. It preserves a sense of width, width and spaciousness uh, when you're allowing a degree of stereo, uh, lack of stereo separation. Or rather, what did I mean to say there? Lack of stereo linking, right? When you're allowing stereo left-right independence. Okay, let's, uh, now that you know what it's doing, uh, let's have a listen again. I'll start with it off. Joshua Tree What have you done to me? Joshua Tree 
Okay, one final thing I'll point out. Some of you may have noticed. Oh, Drew, why aren't you using the highest quality setting? Pristine. That must be an oversight. No, it's not. What is quality doing? Um, quality, I don't like it when people call this setting quality. Uh, this is oversampling. At least I, I, I hope it is, <laughs> unless I've completely misread the manual. This, this should be oversampling. Any device that can create harmonics in the digital realm will have oversampling. And the reason why it'll have oversampling is to prevent aliasing. Now, uh, if you've been watching my recent videos, especially the one that I did called The Science of Clipping, you'll also understand that oversampling and downsampling does more than just address aliasing. It creates overshoots. It increases sample peak level. And unless I'm hearing audible aliasing in the signal, which I am not, then there's no reason for me to enable oversampling. I'm not using this compressor in a way that it's generating harmonics, right? I'm using a very slow attack time and I'm using a kind of medium release time. If I had attack time set at zero and release set at five, maybe I might be getting a little bit of modulation envelope distortion that could cause some harmonics, but I'm not. And um, so in this t for this reason, I'm just setting it to real time. I don't, I don't need or want oversampling. It's not providing any audible benefit in this case. Okay. So I, I really would encourage and hope that people are stopping making the association between quality and oversampling. They are not the same thing. Okay, let's continue. Now we're at the limiter. Limiter, last in chain. And uh, really all I'm doing is tickling it just to, this isn't a banger, right? This isn't a EDM track. Uh, and really all I want to do is, is contain the peaks, um, get the loudness level to be on par with uh, Angus's other releases that I've done for him, which is around the negative 10, negative 11 luffs marks in the chorus of the song. And uh, you can see I have Limitless and Pro L2 that are set up here. And uh, I have those set up identically or as identical as you can get. Limitless is multiband, Pro L2 is not. Uh, and I have them set up so that uh, I can AB between them just by pressing a key. What was the key? C? Yeah. So if I turn one on, I can press a hotkey and just easily switch between them. Okay. So uh, the limiter that I, well, you guys tell me which limiter you like better. Okay. I'll switch between them and let me know in the comments which limiter you think sounds best and then i'll let you know which one i chose okay joshua tree what have you done to me joshua tree i say what have you done to me tough call, hey? Um, this is my first time listening to it in these headphones. Um, I mixed and mastered, I mastered um, this session on my main monitors, on my Neumanns, and uh, I preferred the sound of Pro L2. But now that I'm listening to it on the headphones, I think I prefer Limitless. Um, yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to think about that more. Let me show you what I'm doing in both of the limiters, okay? So, I'm uh, pushing up gain. I'm using the modern style. I'm using a little bit of look ahead uh, just to prevent uh, any distortion. Usually I don't hear distortion anyways, but this is not a loud track. So a little bit of look ahead is good. Um, I changed the release uh, phase a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm using a, a output level of zero, uh, sorry, of negative one. Uh, and that is just to allow because I know this is going to the DSPs, this is going to be on Spotify and Apple Music, and I know that they're going to compress it, and that that's going to add a little bit of um, codec artifacts that will increase through uh, compression amplitude noise gain. And I simulate that, actually, using 
Isotope Ozone 11. I use their codec preview to simulate what that sounds like and how much level that it could add. And then I adjust it so that I'm getting uh, enough ceiling on the final limiter that that's not going to cause a problem with uh, with potential clips. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, let's have a listen with uh, with the limiter. What have you done to me? Joshua Tree. I say, what have you done to me? Okay, so you can see the limiter is really just getting triggered by the drums. That's that's what's hitting it. We're seeing a very small amount, very acceptable range of gain reduction on uh, on the limiter. Okay, so now let's uh, fire up Limitless, make it active. Uh, don't be intimidated by all this stuff. Uh, you can hide this stuff. Um, I I dig into it sometimes, uh, especially this advanced area. Uh, but yeah, you can you can kind of use limitless out of the box and just play with these parameters here. You can use some of the presets, but uh, I'll show you how I have it set up. Let me just play you uh, the song first. Joshua Tree, what have you done to me? Joshua Tree. Okay. So we have uh, the threshold set, negative six. That's the same as pushing six dB up into a fixed threshold like Pro L2 does. We have the ceiling set at negative one. That's the same thing as setting the output parameter to negative one in Pro L2. We have the release set to 250 milliseconds. And then down here, you can see I've adjusted stereo linking so that we're at uh, 75%. We have uh, 0.2 milliseconds of look ahead, just like Pro L2. And then uh, I've adjusted the dynamics so that it's prioritizing the transient aspect of the limiter versus the release phase of the limiter um, more so. And um, yeah, I'm not doing anything else in the limiters. Now, what you may have heard and what I'm hearing and what I often hear in Limitless is it sounds a little smoother in the low end and it sounds more open in the top end. And that's why I was like, ooh, I think I'm liking the sound of Limitless. Usually I prefer Limitless over Pro L2 in most of my work, especially when the limiter is working harder. Now, why might that be? Well, um, I really like the way that Limitless has been designed. I have had pretty extensive chats with uh, their team and Dave Gamble, uh, one of the owners of DMG and one of the coders, I think he coded uh, a lot of the, he certainly knows a lot about the code whenever I talk to him. He's nerd level 10 for sure, uh, full respect. Uh, but Limitless is basically a limiter that has been designed to be a sample peak limiter. So it's not oversampling. Uh, which is a really key difference. You'll notice in Pro L2, I also was not using oversampling at all. I do not oversample limiters typically. I'll do another video on that because it's a deep dive and we don't want to get into that here. Um, so Limitless has been designed in such a way that it minimizes the amount of limiting and it does that by splitting things into bands. So it uses uh, crossovers. It uses crossovers that are linear phase, so we're not getting phase smearing from the crossovers, and it's using crossovers that are completely transparent because they're what you call Linkwitz Riley crossovers. Uh, they're they're double cascading Butterworth filters um, for the high pass and low pass portions of the crossover, um, and uh, it's able to provide just the right amount of limiting, kind of Goldilocks zone limiting for each one of the bands, and unlike some multiband limiter algorithms you have control over how much band independence there is. So if something big happens on the bottom band, if it pulls down the next band up or not, that's what's called separation here. And uh, if you have it accentuated, then it can really quite noticeably EQ your song. And if you have it at zero, it, it functions like a single band limiter. I have mine set straddling the pond there at 100. There uh, is a bit of separation between the bands. And uh, it just basically provides an algorithm where you get the least amount of limiting necessary in each aspect of the audio range. And that makes sense to me, and it causes less distortion. This limiter produces less aliasing than without oversampling, because it doesn't even have oversampling. Okay, This limiter does not have oversampling as an option, yet it's one of the flagship limiters, one of the best limiters on the planet. Okay, That should get you curious if you're not yet. It produces less aliasing than other limiters that are at 4x oversampling. 
the math behind this limiter is genius. And I, I know quite a bit about how it works, um, but, but I, yeah, I have to always pull myself back from going nerd level 10 in these videos because I think we've been on this one long enough, haven't we? Are you guys getting tired of watching me uh, talk about audio? Okay, well, let's wrap it up then. The last two plugins, Ozone, I already explained what I'm doing there. I'm just using it to preview the lossy compression codec. And then uh, the uh, uh, this one, the AB, metric AB, I'm just using to show uh, true peak level and RMS and uh, peak to loudness range and all of that stuff here and, and integrated luffs just as a final, okay? And then, um, yeah, we don't need that. That's not doing anything. And then I use Voxango span. This is just what I'm doing to compare spectrums with the... Uh, reference track okay so so they one goes into the sidechain input of the plugin and we can see two spectrums overlaid Joshua Tree. i've gone into this in detail how i set that up in another video i will drop my voxango span setup video for the free version of span you don't need to have the paid version of the plugin to do this and it really helps you just kind of avoid making broad spectral mistakes like, oh, my hi-hats are like six decibels louder than the reference, or I'm missing five dB in the bass or something. It just looking at it visually can help you avoid mistakes like that if you don't have the best studio or the best monitoring system. So let's go ahead and render this because I'm going to show you actually the full process, how I deliver this to my client. And there's a platform that I've been using lately that uh, is pretty sweet that I would like to share with you guys. So uh, we turn all that stuff off. We're going to stay with Limitless. I would normally do my final uh, touch-ups and delivery in RX, you know, do fades and stuff like that. But in this case, we're just sending the client the master so they can approve it. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and render this. All right, so let's fire this over to Angus and see what he thinks. I'm using a service now to send masters out called uh, Samply. Um, big ups to my buddy Sam Ryan, who... Uh, Turn me on to that one. So let's get Samply all spooled up. So we just create a new project here. There we go. And then I can uh, just go ahead and drag the file over. So all we do is we click to copy the link and then I can text it to Angus, sweet. So there you have it. I know this was a longer and more detailed video, but I really wanted to show you the, the full process and explain the nitty gritty of why I'm choosing these effects. Because when you get to your master, uh, these little details matter. And a lot of these plugins that I'm using are deep plugins with a lot of settings on them. And it takes quite a bit of iteration and experience to be able to, to get those right. And it takes getting them wrong sometimes, which I've done for sure. Um, to be able to figure out what not to do. Yeah. So if you liked this video, I am making a lot of my mastering sessions available for free. I will drop the playlist for that below this video so you can check out the other sessions. And in general, if you want to learn more about audio engineering and mixing, doing your own DIY mixes, I have a whole playlist on mixing as well, including a lot of the techniques that I would use um, in all kinds of different mixes in different genres. Sweet. Drop me a comment. Let me know what you thought about this video. And if there's any requests you have for upcoming content or if you have any questions about this. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do. We've been growing a lot lately and uh, I want to thank everybody who's been supporting the channel. It's been so nice to see so much activity and good vibes around here. So please subscribe if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up if you like this video and I will catch you on the next one. Happy music making. Take care.